Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I will be your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe here at the show that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome to the show Mayor Rennie Harper of the town of Nipawin of the province of Saskatchewan. Rennie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. So, Rennie, let's start with the question I've asked every single mayor, councillor, any elected official who's ever been on the show. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, uh, this is a bit of a story. Um, I love stories. So I, I know you do. So I'm an immigrant to Canada. I'm a, um, My family and I came here when I was a young girl. Um, j there's just my mom and my dad and myself. So the three of us immigrated from Germany. And um, I think my sense of this sense comes from my parents, but also from the fact that you come from a country um, to another country that provides you everything. Um, Canada's provided my education, my safety, my career, and it has my my total loyalty. Um, I owe Canada and the communities that I've lived in everything. And uh, so both my parents rebuilt their lives and um, they earned a living. They, they were able to build a home coming from a country that had been war torn uh, and and so on and so forth so uh and they raised their family here and they've instilled in me this this uh, obligation if you will i it, it's more it's not really an obligation but but for lack of a better word this obligation to repay um and pay forward right um my mother also uh is a nurse so i come from from this background of of caring people and so on and so forth and uh, when she when we first came to this country, she wasn't able to to nurse uh, because she couldn't speak English and uh, none of us could speak English. We, my dad had like 40 bucks in his pocket when we got here uh, and three suitcases uh, held everything that we owned. And we arrived on Thanksgiving Day um, uh, in so in mid October in Saskatchewan, uh, cold winter, no place to be um, and sort of on a train station in Saskatoon. And 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 I I think that that's influenced my whole entire life. So was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up? Because you could have given back in many different ways through volunteerism, through nonprofits, <laughs> but you chose the political route. And this main mm -hmm. section of the show is about the first section of the show is about getting to know why people choose to go into municipal politics. So was there a political influence in your life or are you sort of the black sheep of the family who got into politics in their in their career? Well, I don't know if I'm the black sheep because I have a cousin uh, whom I've never met uh, in, in Germany still, who is the mayor of a small community. So it's an interesting dynamic. But, um, you know, I really didn't choose to get involved in municipal politics or politics of any kind. And I actually, uh, I have a really hard time considering myself a politician. I consider myself an advocate for the community that I live in. Um, and so... I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't. I didn't choose to get involved in municipal politics. It's more like I agreed to let my my name stand at the insistence of other people, right? So, because I'd I'd been a long, I'd had a long role in in healthcare. Uh, I I started as a clerical person in in mental and public health, and um, so like I, I came kind of from this history of wanting to be involved and and wanting to make a difference um so i i started out by saying that i was uh, a staff member for public and mental health and when you do that you you learn about the challenges that face all of the staff so the public health nurses the mental health nurses so on and so forth and i learned from them that there were things in the system that were broken at least I, they seemed to me that they were broken. And uh, so 
I, th I think from them, I started to lobby for for some changes and and uh, went back to school after my kids grew up and uh, became a social worker. I have a degree in social work um, and and not a social worker for individuals so much as for individuals like individuals for bigger groups. So changing policy, changing processes and affecting how people work in that way. And, and that's how I think I kind of got involved in, in this municipal realm uh, because I wanted to change and may have an impact on um, the lives of people, but the people I worked with initially so I want to talk about the first election. And now correct me if I'm wrong here, Rennie, for a second. You first ran for public office. Well, you first were elected mayor in 2016. You were recently reelected in 2020. Was 2016 right. your first election or did you run for councillor before that? Or did you run right out of the bat no. for mayor? I ran right out of the bat for mayor. So what uh, what happened in what happened in 2016 that made you decide okay now is the time was it like you said the influence of outside pressures of people asking yeah. you or was there an yeah. issue burning in Nipawin that you said I need to address it and I'm the one who can do it No I don't think so I think it was more of this 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 conviction by other people that I had just retired and I was the right person to run for the role of mayor and um and so I agreed and and gave it my all and here I am I want to talk about that first election, that 2016 election for a second, because we all believe that we have a pulse on the community, especially when we put ourselves forward for elected officials. When you were door knocking, when you were talking to the residents of your community, were there issues that were being raised that you were happy about that like people were talking about? And then were there issues that you said, I'm surprised that this is being raised because I thought it would have been addressed or no one's talked about it. And I'm glad someone is. I don't know if I could really say that there, there were a couple of things. Um, we have a, we have a, a facility, a convention kind of facility that's next to our golf course. It's called our evergreen. And for some time um, it had always had a restaurant in it. And for some time that restaurant had been closed and, and uh, it's kind of a pivotal point in, at that, in that building. And for those facilities, the curling club and the golf club and stuff like that. And people were so upset because this restaurant wasn't, wasn't open and so on and so forth. So that, that was one of the issues. The other issue uh, that I recall was um, we have a, a large green space in the center of our community. It's called Central Park. And um, there had been some um, land sold, a portion of Central Park, that long-term green space had been sold to a private developer. And, and uh, a lot of people were upset about the fact that uh, that had been done without a lot of consultation. And and so those were kind of the issues of the day. But I don't think it, I, I think those are, they were the focus, but I think every smaller community, every community has issues. And so I, I don't know if I can pick on any one thing particularly. There was also this, you know, um, I also have, a, I have a degree or a certificate certification from the Johnson Shioma School of Public Policy. And so governance and how to govern without sort of sticking your nose in everything um, was high on my priority list. So and it was something that I understood really well and thought that I could help with. Oh, okay. okay. Um, you 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 you've you've opened up a box here. I want to play in it for a second here. What does good governance mean to Rennie Harper? It means um, my nose in, but my fingers out. It means um, know what's going on, understand how that fits, um, but let the administration run the show. That's what it means to me. Is that easy to do? Chris, that's not easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, can I can imagine so. But going back to that first election in 2016 here for a second, we all remember the first time you walk into that ballot box and you get to put an X beside your own name. You get yeah. to put that X and you get to walk out and say, at least I've gotten one vote. Even if no one else votes for me, at least I know I voted for myself. What was that experience like for you to see your name on that ballot and know that now the, the, the choice is in the voters' hands? Was it a surreal experience? And do you still get that experience when you ran in 2020? 
it's kind of humbling because yeah. you know as 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 people and especially as female people you're 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 taught not to do exactly that right not to stick your name forward and 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 not to vote for yourself and not all of those things right so it is kind of surreal when when you think yeah i've got my name on this ballot and people are going to choose um it's it's frightening but it's also empowering it's also um I, I don't know exactly how to say this, but um, it, it's probably more humbling than anything else. It's sort of how on earth did I get here? And We're why so am I doing this? You know, like you ask yourself, why did I, you ask me, I, I don't know why I chose to do this. I have no idea. But you seem to enjoy it. It doesn't seem like something that you, because you wouldn't put your name for reoffer for mayor if you didn't enjoy yeah. the job. I do. And, and, you know, partly part of the reason why, why a person enjoys this kind of job, it's not about the negativity and it's not about all the challenges. It's more about the fact that you get uh, to put your community's face forward and, uh, and, and, and perhaps to make some changes that affect um, not just a few people, but more than a few people. I wanted to go back to the very first time you walked into the council chambers as mayor elect for the town of Nipawin. There's a responsibility that mayors and councillors have to put on their shoulders to ensure that the decisions they make uh, are best for their community, but also best for the people who live there, because you're making decisions that are going to affect the uh, budget, people's taxes, people's pocketbooks. Yeah. How much of a responsibility do you put on your shoulders to make sure that the decisions you are making is in the best interest of everyone and not just a few people? A lot. Um, I take things very seriously and, and, and very personally. So not only does the decision that I and the rest of council make, and I am only one vote. So um this is this is always a group decision. These are always group decisions, but it's a huge responsibility, Chris. Um, and you don't always do it right. And you know, is it easy? Is it easy to make these decisions? It's okay. not easy. And and the biggest part of it is to do as much homework as you can before you decide. Um, and you know, I'm I'm kind of the kind of individual too that wants to model what I expect other people to to do. I, I want them to see that I'm going to put as much effort or more than I expect from others. Um, and so there's always a lot of homework to do, uh, a lot of talking to do. Um, you know, I, I while I while, while it, there's a lot of talking and a lot of learning, counselors like yourself and mayors like yourself, I should say, can't be cement it in their opinions on an issue because you may have an opinion on what your the decision is going to be at the end of the day with the report but and i'm, I'm not i've asked this to a lot of people how important is it for yourself as a local uh, government uh, official to ensure that while you are educated you are open to the idea that some outside perspective whether it be a fellow counselor's communication or whether it be a public hearing can make your decision change because you didn't think of a certain uh, an issue a certain way. It happens at every council meeting. <laughs> it happens over and over and over again. And I can't tell you how many times we as a group have talked about um, you know, you'll get you'll 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 get a resolution in front of you and somebody will put it on the table and you'll start the conversation and somebody across the on the other side of you will say, Well, I was thinking mm -hmm. this and that. And you'll think to yourself, I never even thought of that, right? And so it happens at every council meeting. And it's part of the strength of seven people, right? Uh, to be able to hear what somebody across the table said and think, you know what, I didn't think about that, but it's going to make me change my mind. And it happens does, a lot, more than you that, think. 
does that come into play when it comes to your consideration of what good governance is, is not being cemented, but understanding that you you're there to put your mind in the, the pot, but not the fingers in the pot that sometimes you're not going to be putting your fingers and making decisions on where the greater is going to go, but what the best interest of where the greater should be prioritizing is what is the big issue. And we don't even talk about where the greater should be prioritizing. Shame on us, right? We we talk about um, more about uh, do we need a greater or do we need three graders to do the work uh, that the, the the community demands, right? But yeah, you you're always changing your mind. You're always getting more information and that information. That's good governance. That's what it's about, and that's why you make mistakes sometimes. Uh, Chris, because you, you you maybe don't have all the information and some information comes later uh, once you've made a decision and everybody says, oh, my goodness, why did they do this? And then you begin to think, oh, maybe there needs to be sober second thought here. Are you willing to revisit an issue after you voted on it? And I'm not yes, trying to pick on you. Just that so very recently. Can yes. you explain, can you give me an example of when that happened in the town of Nippon? And I'm not putting you on the spot here. I just find it fascinating that you're willing to say, "Yeah, we make mistakes, and sometimes we have to go back and revisit because I've worked for councils. Yeah, I, sometimes that I'm doesn't not sure happen." I want to give you. I'm not sure I want to give you a specific, but it happened about um, two council meetings ago or a council okay. meeting ago. We had nope. made a decision, uh, perhaps didn't have all the information, uh, thought we were making the right decision, um, found out some things in the next two week period and uh, came forward and rescinded the motion that we made to do more homework. So it, it happens. It's, it's not a one, uh, it's not a one off. Okay. And, and sometimes we just haven't done our homework well enough or we, or, or I'm not sure exactly how, but. Um, no. And I, and I appreciate that. And I'm, I, I don't want to stick on this point for a second because I am cautious of time and I want to get to uh, some other questions here. But before we move to segment two, I want to end with this question. There's a lot of talk recently about the public and private lives of uh, local elected leaders, uh, especially at the municipal level. You are in your community 24-7. You're not going to Regina. You're not going to Ottawa. You are in your community for uh, for the entire time. In your two terms as mayor of the town of Nippawin, have you been able to find that balance of sometimes I just want to be Rennie and I just want to go to the grocery store and pick up a bag of milk or a carton of milk? Or sometimes I know if I go to the grocery store, I'm going to be mayor and I'm going to have to stop and be asked 12 different questions about 12 different issues. So do you find that balance yet? Um, I actually think people, people in my community, at least my experience has been that they're pretty respectful. And yes, you do go to the grocery store and you go do go somewhere and somebody uh, asks you a question and, and debates whether or not you're doing the right thing. Um, but as a general rule, I think people are, are pretty respectful and, and there are ways they come forward. They'll write you an email and ask you to come and ask you to sit and uh, cross from them and just like the lady did this morning and, and, and hear their concern. And um, I'm really, really, really willing to do that. Um, I wish people would come forward more so that you could actually have a face to face and then you wouldn't do that in the grocery store so much. I actually don't mind that. Um, Sometimes when you're in the grocery store and somebody asks you something about town, you actually have a you actually end up um, looking at it differently than you would have if they'd asked you at the council table. Across Canada, we've seen a decline in engagement of municipal politics, whether it be uh, running for council in Ontario, there's a lot of acclamations, whether it be uh, voter turnout being on a lower. And I, this was not a prepared question. It's just you talked about engagement. How engaged are the people of the, the town of Nipawin? And are they engaged in the day to days going on of what's going on at council? I think they are. I think COVID had a bit of an effect, right? Really? Because we did we did a lot of we we had to do a lot of virtual things we didn't have public meetings in the same way um people joined on zoom meetings and so on and so forth but i think on the whole they are engaged and when they see an item that affects them generally they will come forward um sadly it's sometimes on the social media thing and 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 a lot of us as uh as um 
more public people try to stay off that social media but you have to have a bit of a balance there too because you have to you have to know what people are saying um you know so i'm not sure i'm not sure exactly how to answer your question but i, I want to turn no, you sort of you did. You basically said they are engaged, which is good. People be, should be engaged in their democracy. But I want to turn now to segment two. And segment two, I want to preface this first question by saying this is a conversation between Mayor Harper and myself. This is not a decision of council. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy put forward at council. This is the mayor's opinion. We seem to always get emails about this question. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> Mayor Harper, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue as of recording that is facing the town of Nippon today? Well, I'm not so sure there is any one particular thing. Um, so what us, are some of the issues? I, I think some of the issues are are um, that we've had to do some reorg, like um, those kinds of things. And and we've had to change um, financial systems and so on and so forth uh, to make ourselves more effective and have better information. Uh, after all, we are in 2023 and, um, you know, technology has changed. So the impact of, of technology, I think reconciliation in our community is really important. Um, I think the increase in um, crime and drug use is probably one of the central issues for the people of the town of Nippon. Um, it's it's everywhere. It's not just Nippon's issue, uh, which you would all know, Chris. But um, I think I think if I were to ask most of them, uh, people would say uh, the increase in crime, the increase in drug use, the the um, housing issues, you know, the slum landlord kind of issues, those kinds of things are probably high on people's list. So how do you as council and as mayor address these issues? Because um, some of these issues that you've just talked about don't just have a, a municipal lens to them. They do have a provincial and even federal lens to them. I'm speaking of housing and I'm speaking of crime. How do you as mayor and council try to address these issues in the town while working with your other counterparts, whether it be provincial or federal counterparts? So one of the things that we undertook during COVID, it's a, it's a result of COVID, but it's continued. In March of 2020, um, 2021, um, when COVID was first announced, we, we had some issues uh, uh, in town our surrounding communities uh, that were sh that were shut down. One of our First Nation communities, for example, was shut down, and so we were trying to figure out how how could we assist them. And so um, I brought a group of people together. It's turned out to be about thirty agencies and individuals and partners. Uh, to talk about how could we, what could we do to assist, and how could we communicate so that we all knew what was going on with COVID. Uh, we called ourselves the interagency, we, we now call ourselves the interagency communication group. And at the time when we first started, we met weekly um, by Zoom to talk about what were the issues, uh, how many cases did we have, what could we do, how could we help people, um, so on and so forth. And that communication has continued. Um, nobody wants to disband it. We don't meet as often, but we talk about um, the issues like mental health services and access to mental health services and uh, what are the crime issues in our community and how can we help that? And as a result of that, and homelessness has come up a lot. And as a result of that, as partners, we've supported our Salvation Army, for example, in starting a, um, um, a food truck. Um, that a, mo a mobile unit that goes around our community and helps feed some of the homeless folks. Um, we've done things like create a, a directory for um, services that anybody can access. It's it's hosted on the town of Nippon's website, but it's available by by a. Uh, um, UPC code, you know, people can can scan the code and and access the, the document and see where they might be able to get some resources and phone numbers and email addresses and things like that. And so we communicate regularly. We, we 
we talked about uh, immunization and where could people get it. We talk about how people can access tax, tax fill, uh, submitting their tax information, uh, and how do we do that together. And on that, we have agencies like the Salvation Army, Social Services, Education, the Town of Nippon. We have uh, retailers. We have the Chamber of Commerce. So it's a it's a broad spectrum that affects our whole community. Um, and, and that's kind of how we stay in touch. Um, and one of the things that came out of that was um, Citizens on Patrol program that had been in Nippon at one point in time, but had disbanded. Uh, it's now been rejuvenated. It's a program that's um, driven by the RCMP, but supported by the rest of the community. So we try to work interagency, not just as the town of Nippon, because we don't have all the answers. Is there like buy-in from the community? Is the, I'm saying that there's but is there buy-in from the community? Because when you talk about citizens on patrol, that's a big or that's a big uh, task for not just the town to take, but residents to take in as well. We go back to yeah. that question about engagement. Mayor Harper, um, are people willing to help out when uh, people are struggling and they see these issues, whether it be crime, homelessness, and it sounds like they are, aren't they? They are. And you know, this COPS program was raised at a, uh, there, the Chamber of Commerce actually hosted a, a public meeting to talk about the issues of crime and so on and so forth, uh, May of last year. And out of, uh, and then they had a, a, a meeting to talk about this COPS program, the RCMP headed that, and about 80 people signed up to participate. And it's taken a while for the organization to get all its ducks in a row because they have to become nonprofit and they have to have money and they have to have training. Um, but they've done all of that now. They have a chairperson and, and so on and so forth. And they're going to begin training and people have signed up to help. Yes. We've talked it's about the nature of this community. We've talked about some macro issues here, whether it be overarching issues, whether it be crime, drugs, homelessness, housing, but there's also micro issues. If I go talk to 100 people in your community, they might talk about some of these issues that you just addressed, but they may also talk about some of the micro issues. My pothole needs to be fixed. My park in my community needs to be upgraded because I have kids and I want my kids to go play there. Right. How do you as mayor and council take these issues and make sure that everyone feels like they're getting uh, their fair uh, proportion of what the town is, but also move the town forward without feeling like anyone's being left behind on these micro issues, whether it be a pothole or a park upgrade or someone wants different service levels at the community facility? Well, I thought about that. You asked me that question in writing and I and I thought about that a little bit. And and I already mentioned to you that like I'm really keen on people coming forward and speaking one on one. Because what often happens is my pothole isn't just my issue there are other potholes right and so what you discover pretty quickly is that despite the fact that somebody has a certain thing it's probably evidence of more of it and um i'm a, again i'm a social worker by nature uh and i'm the kind of social worker that wants to to change the overall for the better uh so finding out what the pothole is in front of your house and how that connects to whatever is probably the thing I like the best. Um, often, often uh, these one-time concerns show you that there are bigger issues. Um, and so that's how, and then those come to council and those come to a CTAC committee, this, this interagency that I was talking about. And, and you find out that there's a whole lot bigger issue. And, and the COPS program was like that. We we always try to do the best for our communities, especially when they're councillors and mayors. Um, but engagement is one thing. Communication is a completely different aspect of the job because you need to communicate the decisions that council are making and how to move forward as a whole. Are people engaged with it when it comes to communications? Are people willing to give feedback on issues, whether it be my pothole is uh, needs to be fixed? I understand Jimmy's pothole in front of his house is more or worse than mine, but mine is important to me. Is that communication there? And do you feel like the town has that open policy where they can give the feedback if they want to? Well, I like to think that. I'm not sure that I'm right about that, though. <laughs> 
Um, you know, I like to think that we do do quite a bit of communication. COVID again had an impact on that. Like we used to do a regular uh, open house once a year um, in conjunction with our minor sports registration. So we had lots of people coming and going and, and we actually sought all kinds of input. Um, we haven't done that as well as as we could. I I know that for a fact. Um, uh, we need to do more involvement of the community and more surveying and those kinds of things. Um, I want I want to turn to my try, last. Though. No, and I appreciate even trying is is the first step. But I want to ask this last question before we turn to the last segment because I am cautious of time here, and I know you are a busy woman, um, a busy mayor, and a busy person just in general. But I want to know, if I came to you at the end of 2023 and I asked you, Mayor, remember when we talked back at the year, beginning of the year and you said this was the thing that you wanted to get fixed and you're hoping to have it done by the end of 2023? What is that issue for you? What is the issue that you're hoping to get accomplished by the end of this year? So in 2023, um, what I'm what I'm looking for is I'm hoping that we can develop our a new uh, official community plan. It's something that we need to do. I'm hoping that we can enhance economic development and enhance the citizen consultation. Uh, and through an OCP is, is one way that you can do that. So enhancing communication with the citizens of my community is probably the thing I wanna do most. I want a better financial, I want better financial data and a new financial operating system. And I wanna be able to grow the community if I if I if I could have a magic wand, I'd like to think that perhaps someday uh, Nippon could become a city. Perhaps not, but perhaps maybe. So I'm going to I'm going to turn to my last segment here because I know I'm just like I said, I'm cautious of time here. And. I want to talk about tourism. I love tourism. I love tourists. I love being a tourist. I love spending my tourism dollars here in Canada instead of somewhere else. I have pledged that if you come on my show. I am coming to your community. So I will be in the town of Nipawin oh. later this year, actually probably in April when this is airing, because I'm going to be at Suma and I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that I'm going to be able to make a drive out to Nipawin as Nipawin as well. So Mayor Harper, in your opinion, what should tourists, what should my listeners and my viewers do in the town of Nipawin if they visit your community? Oh, there's, my goodness, Chris. First of all, I look forward to seeing you at SUMA. I'm the VP I... of Town SUMA, so I so I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Um, there are a lot of things to do in the town of Nippon. Um, and you know, I'm not sure if you know. I'm not sure if you're an angler. Are you? I I have fished twice in my life, and both times they did not end well for me or the fish or the oh, boat fish. that capsized. <laughs> Okay. So um, one of the things that I'm not sure if you're aware, but some of the events that we have, the Premier's Cup uh, and the Vanity Cup, they're both uh, North American wide tournaments. Um, both are the richest uh, tournaments in North America. Uh, the prize, the prize is what I mean here. Uh, we have a huge turnout for for that. So fishing, um, traveling along the river on houseboats, um, the same river that the voyagers traveled on uh, to Cumberland House. Um, that is an experience all of its own. You don't have to fish. You can just ride the houseboat and and look at the eagles along the way and and can and you you might be able to hear the past voices of the voyagers. I'm telling you, um, and snowmobiling. Uh, we often ha we have wonderful trails. We have wonderful groups that uh, look after the trails. We actually just hosted 240 snowmobilers at uh, the Saskatchewan Provincial Snowmobile uh, Festival. Uh, so, so we have a lot of that. If you look online, and unfortunately, it's been closed due to safety issues at the moment, but um, we have the only crooked bridge anywhere. Um, the traffic ran, ran below it. It was built in about 1930. And the traffic ran below it. I actually learned to drive on that bridge. Uh, and the railway runs across the top. And um, um, if you if you look on our on the website, you'll see pictures of it. 
Um, so that's that's um, um, a bit of a highlight. Uh, we have a second to none museum that's called Living Forestry. They have a celebration on July 1st that's truly uh, second to none. They bake bread and, and uh, run equipment that's been rejuvenated and cut logs, uh, which is part of the history of this community. Um, we, if you come during our NIP1 fair, our exhibition has been here for a long time. Um, we have a parade and then following the parade, we have a street fair, um, which last year saw about 500 people on Main Street, um, visiting with each other, um, uh, sharing food, looking at old cars, um, petting zoos for the kids, uh, and then going on to the exhibition. Um, we have a golf course that if you research uh, Nip Evergreen Golf Course, it's high on the list of Canadian golf courses, 18 holes, um, also second to none. Um, you can come off the golf course and go to a restaurant that you that for an experience that you might not have. Um, what else can I tell you? We have a, a, a sanctuary called North Street Sanctuary. That's a wildlife sanctuary, bird sanctuary uh, that's been here for history. Um, it sounds like there's something for everyone. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, it's a wonderful place to be. And, uh, you know, we call ourselves a town for the people that's exceptional by nature. And I know you're running out of time, but... I'm nothing if I'm not prepared. I want to read you a poem. And it was written by a lady called Annie McCara um, that was from here. There's a place that welcomes me in the spring, the promises, color, and warmth to come, and freshest green its grass and bud spring to blanket the colorless landscape glum. There's a place in summer I like to pass through where wildflowers cheerily frame the trails and patchwork crops stretch yellow and blue under big puffy clouds unfurling their sails. There's a place that beckons me back in the fall, a paint box of colors mid swamp spruce and pine where the crisp fresh air, fresh air has a pungent call this way to cranberries ripe on the vine. There's a quiet place that in winter keeps its colored lights twinkling in glistening snow while buried underbrush in whiteness sleeps and children make snowmen and cheeks aglow. There's a town at this place that I long to share. Its friendly acceptance still brightly shines where the people are kind and welcome you there. It's known as Nipworn, Pearl of the Pines. So Pearl of the Pines, town for the people, exceptional by nature uh, at the end of the rainbow. Those are all things that have been used to describe the town of Nippon. What more can I say? You, you have painted an amazing picture, uh, Mayor Harper, but I want to ask this question because I still have two questions left here. Um, <laughs> the, the question, though, going back to tourism, after a long day, after a hard day at council, like stressful meeting, where do you go in the town to decompress? Where do you go to just let it all flow away and just get back to reality? My best answer to that is home. But <laughs> every mayor other... wants to say that. I know because it's true. And my other answer is I go to all of the same places that all of the rest of the people in my community go to um, because it's amongst them that you find that you find the information that you find your best piece. My last question to you, Mayor Harper, and this is the million dollar question. This is the question that you probably get all the time, but I'm asking it right here, right now. What makes the town of Nippon such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? In my opinion, we're progressive. We're, it's a safe community, despite some of the things that you've heard me say that are happening all across Canada and, and the world, not just here in Nippon. It's a safe community. It has a wonderful education system. Um, it has uh, good health care provision, uh, even though sometimes we struggle with physician recruitment, just like everybody else. It has citizens willing to engage in things like cop pro pop, cops program to mitigate some of the increased crime that we see it's a wonderful place to live chris um the uh, people are friendly people are willing to help each other still and um 
I can't see living anywhere, uh, anywhere else. And I've lived other places. Um, I came, I came here from Saskatoon. Um, I've lived other places. I wouldn't trade it on a bet. Mayor Harper, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing this today. This has been an honor to get to know you a little bit. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person later on in April when we sit down and at SUMA and hopefully we'll be able to grab a coffee or just say hi to each other when we're there. But thank nice. you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing this today. You're you're most welcome. Uh, <laughs> a few questions that I hadn't really thought about, but uh, thanks much. You, you did an amazing job. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least 15 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, just keep talking. <laughs>